want to start off by saying I was born and raised in Paris. And I know immediately the expectation that comes to your mind is gondolas and the Eiffel Tower, right? Parisian food and vacations and romance. But none of that was true um, because the Paris that I'm talking about is Paris, California, which is spelled P-E-R-R-I-S. <laughs> and Paris, California is a far distance away from the Perry that probably came to mind. It is a small rural town um, of people, blue collar workers. You know, our biggest name to fame is the Walmart that everyone aspires to be managers at when they grow up. We did school to go to the movie theaters. We eat at Del Taco and Alberto's and enjoy uh, star donuts from across the street. Everything about it was limited in some ways, um, in the same way, very loving and very familiar and very much like a little bit of a box, one that I hold really close to my chest when I think about home. And for me, growing up in a place like that had certain expectations, maybe much like you had the expectations surrounding what Paris would be like. For me, this idea of success was its own little box that peaked open when we talked about graduating high school and a class graduating class of 422 kids, right? Where only two of them actually left to go outside of the state to college. And most people stayed at home um, taking courses to become teachers just to reinvest themselves back into our normal high school that kind of everyone went through one track. And all of those things are really beautiful for a lot of people. There is an aspiration in managing a large chain store. There's an aspiration in finding a way to give back to your community on a very local level. And teachers, of course, are admirable. But for me, there was something inside me that wanted something else that was odd and different and that most people saw as being too big, maybe, for the walls of Paris, California. Most of my friends still live there with their families or nearby areas just outside Los Angeles and they live happy lives. And so I don't want to diminish that in any way. I also know that for me from a very young age, there was something else that I wanted. And maybe it was my father's voice always whispering that I could be anything that I wanted to be, even if it was an underwater basket weaver, as he would often say. Or maybe it was my love of big stories like the Chronicles of Narnia that cast me into far off places through a wardrobe that I could wander off and become somewhere brand new. I found myself carrying a notebook at a very young age. I mean, younger than I can ever imagine or than I cast that my children even do. My mom says when I was four, instead of carrying around a stuffed animal, I would carry around a spiral notebook and a pen to write with. And then I would scribble down images and poems from before I could ever remember. People often ask me how long I've been a writer. I have no idea. But what I do know is that there is something in it that fulfills me like other things never would. And there is some way that I traverse the page and use it as a jumping off point into something that fulfills me in ways that no other career has been able to do. Now, let's be honest, I've tried some. Growing up, my mom offered me the idea of being a lawyer. And I thought, what better to be, right? A high powered entertainment lawyer in LA where I could represent all of the stars and go all to the, all the galas and the award shows and be ever present that I would be rich and drive a Jaguar S-type in black with black leather. <laughs> I wanted that life because why wouldn't I? And at the same time, could not see the forest for the trees. I found myself often feeling like I was standing on a cliff staring out at this large castle with this vast gulf between me, where I was and where I wanted to be and no way to get to it. And part of that was the problem with where I lived that my camp counselors were happy if I just graduated high school. Um, I was actually one of the two students that left, going to the University of Michigan, go blue, and double majoring in English and African-American studies, something that I was told I would never get a job having, a degree in black studies. What are you gonna do with that? But for me, I knew that I wanted to make space for my culture in my education. 
I knew that it was something that hadn't been afforded to me during my high school career and even times before that. And there was something in me that wanted to connect to a bigger understanding of who I was. So I invested my time in it. I went from performing at talent shows and winning trips to Disneyland in high school to performing on a national uh, poetry slam team for the University of Michigan. And people told me then that I wasn't gonna be able to do anything with it. It was a great hobby to travel around performing for places like the Kellogg Foundation and being paid in brand cereal. You know, the dream of any college student is to be paid in food. <laughs> but for me, I thought that it could parlay it into something else. So when I graduated, I ran into my writing in the ways that I was working with young youth at the time to figure out their voices and to develop programming at my local community centers. I knew that there was something more than just the writing and something more than just the community involvement that I knew I could figure out a way to balance. So when I moved here to Houston from California via Ann Arbor, Michigan, I wanted to continue in those same veins. I sought out places that were already working with young writers and I plugged into them. Um, I got a teaching certificate and decided that I was gonna be a teacher and teach kids how to write. And though I was interrupted by a few standardized tests, I do really believe that I did that. I maintain great relationships with a lot of my former students. But for me, every turn I've taken has been some unexpected route, whether it be getting up in the middle of the night and deciding I'm moving to Houston, Texas, 1,500 miles away from my parents at the time, packing all of my belongings with no job, no home, and no path forward, and finding my way to Houston by God's grace alone, whether it be tackling on to some of the biggest projects I ever thought I would do, like working with the Houston Rockets or the Houston Ballet. At every chance I have walked into the fire. You know, we often say the word trailblazer, but I don't know that we ever really meant, thought about what it meant, that it's this idea that you literally hold fire in your hand and cast it forward to make a brand new path for yourself. How dangerous is that? Risk it all to be burned by your own ambitions. But at the end of the day, there's something in that. For me, many, 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 many people told me that success for me would be money and be riches and be wealth, be fame and renown would be something intangible. I remember going to a fellowship a few years ago where I was told as a writer that if I wanted to be famous, then I needed to get ready to die, literally die, that no one would enjoy my work until I was dead. And that if I wanted to be a parent and be a writer, I should know that I'm never gonna be successful in the literary arts community. I laughed at both of these things in the same ways that people laughed at me when I told them that I wanted to be the poet laureate of the fourth largest city in the nation, or that I wanted to open an opera with Houston Grand Opera, the fifth largest opera house in, Houston, in the nation. Both of those things I did. As the first black poet laureate of Houston, I was able to create platforms for new voices to exist in this city. I was able to celebrate voices that had been doing work and existing. And more importantly than anything, I hope to serve as a role model for young writers who want to figure out how do I take all of this ambition in me and do something with it that no one understands. I'll tell you that most of my most successful moments had nothing to do with money had nothing to do with something I would write on my resume or my CV, but they have to do with moments just like this, where I'm able to encourage people to cast aside all the doubts they have about being the weirdest person in the room and run straight into the fire. This box of success that we so adamantly propose, this idea that there's only one way to be successful in this world is so limiting. It's such an understatement to all the creativity that you have in you and that I have in me. I remember winning a, a, my, one of my first talent shows and being against all the dancers at my school, which I went to kind of a weird high school where the football players and the athletes didn't really get any love because our football team kind of sucked. But the dancers and the performers, they were the ones that kind of ran everything. So to go from being known as kind of the wallflower at the sock hop to being known as that poet girl who won everything at every talent show was a huge step for me and something that I count as one of my first successes. There's success that's waiting for you even right now as you sit wherever you are wondering 
what am I doing? Why do I have this thing gnawing at me that I can't shake loose? A few years ago, I decided that I wanted to start a quarterly summit for writers of color here in the city of Houston. And I was so excited that I reached out to a few friends of mine and I partnered with places like Tintero Projects and Imprint and said I wanted to launch this huge thing under a new nonprofit organization. And while reaching out, and not to those organizations, but to some people in the community, one of the first things that I heard was, you're too small to do this. You should hand this off to a larger organization, one that has the administrative power and the knowledge to be able to make pull this off. They couldn't see what was in me. And that's okay. You know, not everybody is made to see the vision that's created in you. Not everyone can see the thing that you're working out in its full volume and bloom. And sometimes I've learned as a gardener, you plan a lot of things and you just hope that the sun makes them grow. But sometimes people don't wanna buy into the sun and the water and you gotta do it on your own. Sometimes you have to force people into a new understanding of who you are. I look now at my mom, this woman who so adamantly wanted me to be a lawyer because she told me that I could sell ice to uh, Eskimos at the time. And uh, she constantly tells me now how proud she is of me, how she doesn't understand how I've done anything that I've done, but that she stands at all of my work. That's another success I take, one that lives outside the box of this mainstream understanding of society. Now, when I say that I'm a poet, I would love to say that people fall over in amazement at all the things that I've been able to do with words, that they recognize my name in some huge magical way that New York Times bestsellers get to be recognized. But most people let their mouths fall open and gawk like an ellipsis is falling off of their lips, waiting for me to acknowledge some real job that I have. And while I do serve as part of my time as a teacher for the high school for the performing and visual arts, I count myself an artist above all. When I sit down at night or I fill out a form that asks me what I do for a living, I write poet proudly because for so many people, that's not a job that they've ever seen in their communities, it's one that's been viable, that allows you to live and eat every day, to pay bills and to be present with your family. I constantly write that I'm a mother and bring my children to events with me because it's important, not only that they see me on stage, but that People see that they're there with me, that I have not sacrificed a moment to bear a family or to chase my career, and that both are counted as successes. While I teach with some of the best educators that I've ever met in my entire life, being in the classroom wasn't gonna be enough for me. I had to have a balance. So whether it's making earrings in my spare time or playing classical piano that I've been doing since a very young age, whether it's writing or reading a brand new book, whether it's finger painting with my children, I find a space where I can find success in all of those things. I once wondered why I was wired so differently. At a young age, I did things like play piano and I danced in my local church. Um, I took photography with my father and sang with a local choir. And how do all of those things connect to me now being a writer? I didn't have any idea how that worked until the Houston Grand Opera reached out to me to write my first opera. And I found myself thinking of every image that I'd caught in the, in the camera, every song I'd sung with the Michigan Gospel Choir or other choirs, every note that I played on my piano in a back rehearsal room at Paris High School, uh, trying to figure out things by listening to them because I didn't know how to read music. And all of them converged into what I was able to create in Marion's song, Oh, an opera that is now actually up and playing around the city of Houston and is available virtually, if anyone wants to see it. That for me was a giant step forward in showing that my work is not just a space where it lives in my body, but that it can live in other people's bodies too. That I can have a song written in my voice, the way that I can a scene and the way that I can a poem. My life is a patchwork of beautiful and ridiculous aspirations, and it always has been, and it always will be. For me, people have always told me that I needed to somehow confine myself and be smaller, but the greatest joy has come in being as big as I wanted to be at every single moment. So I'm gonna urge you to do just that. 
take a big breath and think about all of those things that you've always thought were too big for you to ever accomplish. Write them down even, make yourself a list. I have so many lists around my house because I don't wanna lose a single idea. And then quiet every voice that tells you that you can't do that or that that's not big enough or that you won't be a success. And if you don't have anyone else to look at, look at me because I was odd and weird and had a path that no one saw forward. And even if your dream is underwater basket weaving, know that there is a space in this world that needs you to make this a better place to change and shift and grow the people around you. That you have something special, something that no one else may understand, but is necessary for you to break out of their box of success and find your own path forward. I'm wishing you the best as you take this new journey.